All right. Welcome to Stop Avoiding Tough Conversations. It's our quarterly, can you believe it? Our quarterly um, webinar. I don't know what we talked about last quarter, but it seems like a long time ago. We are excited to be back. So welcome to our webinar at Slingshot 25 or welcome back. Um, if you have questions, you can post it in the Q&A. We will try to ad address the questions that come up in the conversation. Um, we will send a link to this recording out to everyone who registered after. So if we don't get to it, we may have some Q&A responses there. Um, we asked a question in our registration that was really, I think the first time we tried anything quite like this and asked, what's the biggest challenge you all are having with tough conversations? And so we'll be bringing some of your responses into that. If you want to try the Q&A and um, post some of your response to that, what you think makes a tough conversation tough, um, feel free to do that to get warmed up. Um, I think that's all for that. Let's tell you a little bit for those of you that haven't met us about Slingshot 25. We are a consulting company that gets called upon whenever organizations are trying to make lasting change in really tricky spaces. So we rely on change management skills and communication practices, whether that's developing and training change management practitioners or actually doing communication consulting and contracting work for teams that are trying to drive change. We do that. Um, we get a lot of calls and help teams that are having team performance issues, whether that is just um, sometimes that's I have a team performance issues because two people on the team aren't getting along and we end up exploring some coaching or um, in other cases, like we just have people saying, hey, we want to increase the performance of our team. We want to drive a great culture here. Can you help us out? So we do that. And all of our work backs into probably the cornerstone of our mission at Slingshot 25, which is develop great leaders. And that's anchored in our leadership development training, whether that is our um, cornerstone class called the Truth of Leading Others. I know some of you have been through our program, so it's good to see you here. Or our change management training or classes like Tough Conversations, which you're going to hear more about today. So we do coaching, training, consulting, and workshops across um all of these facets, it's kind of a twisted rope because it's kind of, we use all the tools sometimes to help teams perform. But that is us, what we do, a little bit more about us. Um, Jackie and I are your presenters for today. We have been helping corporations do this kind of thing uh, for the better part of, well, over 20 years. Um, and we really do mean the messy stuff because we are in the business of helping leaders understand that they're in the people business and people are complex and they are messy and they are unpredictable and they are wonderful. And it's our job as leaders to get the best out of them and create environments where they can be amazing. So that's what we do. We really challenge leaders to think differently about what their job is, what it means to lead their responsibilities. Think about who's following them and why leadership matters um, so that we can make lasting change. Cause we believe that organizations need great leaders um, people deserve an awesome place to work and all that stuff's very, very related. Um, if you guys want to follow more about us, we do, we give away a lot of content. So if you want to help your teams, whether it's using our podcast, our Jack chat series, articles that we post, um, please follow us online. We like to see new LinkedIn followers. We like to see likes on our podcasts and videos. Um, we are far from the generation that, you know, I don't think we're going to be social media influencers tomorrow but you know who knows i bet there's a there's a, there's a need for people like us maybe to be in the social scene so we'll see if you want to follow us for the good of your company and to share our resources i'd encourage you to do that um all right so let me get into what we're going to talk about today tough conversations um we end up talking a lot to leaders to groups whether it's change conversations um, low performer on my team conversations. These two people don't get along conversations. Um, we get a lot of requests to help people get better at having tough conversations. And it, it's interesting when you unpack it, like sometimes we're like, why, why is there just such a demand for this? Right. Why, why do we want to talk about tough conversations at all? And the truth is all teams are just a makeup of human beings. And human beings to perform, to work together well, they have to have a relationship. 
Let me go to the next slide. So when we improve our relationships, when we understand that all of our interactions come down to a very, very simple thing, which is a conversation. If I'm a leader, my employees only experience me through a conversation. If I'm a team member, my teammates only experience me through a conversation. If I'm a parent or a child, our relationships are anchored on conversations. And so if that is the thread that connects us, when we have to have difficult ones, things that threaten threaten that thread, threaten that thread, man, that's hard to say, um, but I think I said it correctly. It becomes really important to us. We want to know how to do that well. And we're going to talk about why this conversation comes up, tough conversations, having good quality conversations at the heart of improving our relationships, keeping them whole, keeping our teams healthy because we need a space where people are talking to each other, willing to communicate, willing to conflict, um, bring trust and higher performance to the team. And so what we want to talk about is like, if conversations are the heart of everything, what makes a conversation a tough one? What's the difference between a tough conversation and every other conversation we have? So I'm curious, you guys are welcome to add your thoughts to the Q&A. Um, I don't know if I can see the Q&A. Yes, I can. I never know if I, what I can see and what I can't. Um, what makes a, a tough conversation so tough? What makes it different than every other conversation? Hey, let the dog out. Uh, you know, I added these groceries to the target list. Oh, pick up your stuff. Or, yes, a sensitive topic, right? When we asked you guys what makes a conversation, yes, love it. See, it takes you guys one second to think of something and then three more seconds to write it down. So here they all come. Differences, letting know people not meet their expectations. Yes, when we did the, the comments that you guys sent in, we heard things like having the confidence, right, to... Um, stand up for what I think or get articulated about it. I, I'm not very comfortable. It's an uncomfortable thing. You guys are saying that. Um, I want to have the right words, right? To make it that I don't hurt someone's feelings. And the heart of this, what the heart of all of it, what makes a tough conversation tough when you pull back and say, what's at the heart of it? It's the emotions, right? It's, it's the thought that I'm going to make someone my words could have an impact that makes someone feel something they don't want to feel, whether that's embarrassment or guilt or shame or sadness or discomfort, right? Think about it. When we have conversations that are, they're not emotional, they don't trigger anything, we'll have those conversations all day long. But it's the ones that are going to trigger an emotion that's that that feels like all of, there's not bad or good emotions, but we don't want to put sadness on someone else. We don't want to put anger on someone else. We don't want to be get anger back at us, right? It's the emotions that we fear that actually makes tough conversations different than everything else. And so, what I'm going to do, I don't think I I didn't spend a lot of time introducing Jackie. I don't Jackie want to introduce yourself, um, but I'm going to have Jackie take us through some of the the psychology. And, and just unpack a little bit the depth that we will go to avoid emotions and conversations. So Jack. All right. Um, so hi, I'm Jackie Pelland. I'm uh, another partner here at Slingshot 25. And um, I spent a lot of time working with leaders and thinking about how hard that job really is. So let's let's dig into this. Let's dig into the psychology of what makes tough conversations so tough. If anyone has ever been in a presentation or a classroom with me before, you've probably heard me talk about this study. I'm obsessed with this study. Um, it's called the Stanley Milgram Study of Obedience. And I, I reference it a lot because I think it's, number one, it's a, it's a fascinating study. It's, it makes a good story. <laughs> and if you haven't heard it, I think you'll be intrigued. Um, but it also reveals some of the deepest challenges of the human condition that um, I think is really relevant to what we're talking about today, as well as a lot of other challenges that leaders experience um, and that um, you as an employee experience in your in your work. So I speak about it often as a way to reveal these challenges. And there's a couple of ways, a couple of you know, sort of big topics that I think this helps 
this helps us get our arms around a little bit. And one is is really not for today, but I'll mention it. It it says a lot about accountability and um and and why accountability is so fragile and, and tough to create in your organization. So I just want to let you know that. Um, we talk in in we have we have courses and workshops and things that are also available to you in how to build accountability in your organization. And you'll see that this study reveals a lot about that as well. But for today, this study also reveals a lot about the nature of tough conversations. Um, you know, Courtney mentioned that we looked through as you registered for this webinar, many of you reported to us what is what what it is so challenging about tough conversations for you. And many of you said, I, I didn't actually do the math, um, but I'm going to guess, you know, a good third to a half of you reported that one of the toughest things about tough conversations for you is having it, <laughs> it's like actually getting the courage to, to, to have the conversation. Um, and so this study you'll see, I think, says a lot about that and lets you know that you're not alone. So let me describe this study for you, kind of this fascinating, very famous study in psychology. So Stanley Milgram was a researcher at Yale University in 1961, and he set about to do a study. And the, the picture that you're looking at is a relic from is, is from that study. And you're probably all <laughs> maybe some of you are even remembering this study. And, and others of you are like, I think this might have something to do with giving people electrical shocks. And you would be right. Um, so he set about, though. In, in that time period to explain why people essentially are obedient when they shouldn't be. Um, you have to remember in 1961, we weren't far away from World War II and the atrocities of the Holocaust. And the world was still trying to figure out why people would just be so obedient in, you know, in doing things that the behavior is, is not something they would otherwise endorse. And so the way this study went down is Stanley Milgram brought in a bunch of participants, you know, volunteer participants, and he randomly divided them into two groups. One was a set of who would be called learners and the other one was teachers. And they said, you know, he separated them. He put the teacher sat in front of this device that you're seeing here on the screen. They sat in front of this device and the learner was on the other side of a wall in the, in the other room, but nearby. Um, and the subjects uh, were to, the teachers were to read off a list of words into a microphone that the participant, the, the learner on the other side of the wall could hear. And they read off a list of words. And every time uh, the participant had to repeat those words, and every time they made a mistake, they were supposed to give them a little zap. And every time they made a mistake, their the teacher's task was to dial up the voltage, so to increase the voltage. Now, the learners and teachers were both told that this was a study in, they weren't told it was an obedience study. They were told that it was a study in measuring the effects of punishment on learning. So they were really sort of blind to what this study was about. And, and so the study began. And of course, the participants, or I'm sorry, I should call them the learners, the learners made mistakes. And so the teachers were to administer those electric shocks. And so it went. And here's what was so fascinating. If we look at the next slide, you'll see something that will blow your mind, which is that those teachers, now remember, they were in a study. This was just a study. They were randomly assigned as a teacher. This wasn't real and they knew it. This is a picture of a man who was actually in the study. 65% um, of those people who played the role of teacher issued potentially fatal shocks. And you see fatal is in quotes there because I think you would you would reasonably guess that that's not what was really going on here. Um, there were no shocks. No one was hooked up to anything. Um, it was just really, you know, an examination of would people just blindly obey? Would they, you know, would they just obey the rules of the study, you know? And they had a researcher in the room with them that any time there was some hesitation in dialing up in dialing up the shock, the researcher would simply say the study shall continue. Now, it turns out that the that the learners were actually in on the study. And of course, they were receiving no shocks. They were all actors, actually, you know, trained to cry out and, and, and to scream for help. And all these other things were going on. But this is this is, I think, the number that should stun all of us. And by the way, this study has been repeated in a more ethical fashion in, in more modern times, and with the same results, with the exact same results. 65% of those people, again, knew they were in a study. Think about this. 
They didn't think that their life was on the line. Um, they knew they were in a study and still 65% of them dialed all the way up to what was clearly labeled on, on, the, on the box as, as fatal, as dangerous or fatal, but they issued it nonetheless. So, you know, I mentioned accountability. It, it, it definitely told the story of how fragile accountability is, that people just took responsibility without feeling any accountability to the outcomes of their actions. So it told us a lot about accountability and how fragile that is. But it also told us, which is relevant to today's conversation, people would rather, I mean, think about this. People would rather issue a fatal shock to someone than have a tough conversation, than say, I'm not okay with this. This is making me uncomfortable to stand up and have a tough conversation. So for those of you who said, yeah, that's one of my biggest challenges, this is why. This is why it's so challenging. I don't want you to feel like you're flawed or you're untalented or you'll never be able to influence or be a, a productive contributing leader or, or, or you know, a, good, a great team member because I just can't have those tough conversations. It's just so hard for me. It's hard for everyone. It's hard for everyone. And I think this study revealed something about, uh, you know, about how deeply this is embedded in sort of the human condition that we do this. So the first thing I would say, just sort of in the way of, of an instruction to you today, I know you all came here, like not just wanting to hear how hard this is, this dismal picture of, of how hard this is, but you also came here looking for some instruction. And so I, I think the point that I would that I would take away from this is 15 minutes of courage. It is hard. It's okay that it's hard. It's okay. It's, it's kind of counter to our wiring in some ways. And we could delve more into that if we had more time. But it is, it's, it's counter to our wiring. It's okay that it's hard. Don't beat yourself up for like how uncomfortable it feels for you. It just takes 15 minute, 15 minutes of courage. Um, we're going to also talk a little bit about how to prepare for the conversation, but 15 minutes of courage. And then I would also say, don't wait for perfect. You're never going to have it perfect. It's always going to be just a little awkward and messy. Totally okay. Um, don't wait for perfect. Don't get it all worked out. We'll talk about the things you should do to prepare, but just the, embrace the messy, embrace the awkward um, and get 15 minutes of courage. So that's kind of, I guess, our first big takeaway from this. Let's just go a little deeper now off of that um, and see what else we find out about the difficulty of this. These are the things I'm guessing that you didn't quite express it this way because the things you see on the on, on the screen here are sort of written from you know the perspective of someone like me who thinks about psychology all the time. And but really this is what you're battling against. You're battling against this idea that a tough conversation has the potential to tear the social fabric. I know no one put it that weirdly, no one put it that way in their, in their comments to us. I, I don't know why tearing social fabric comes so easy to, to the tongue. Um, but what it's really doing is it's creating this sort of deeper threat to the relationship you have with that person um, or um, just a threat to the peace. Like we're all kind of getting along. I don't really want to stir things up. Um, your reputation, your ego, your status. What if you screw this up? What if you say something really stupid and and now just you know right just sort of this this spiraling <laughs> what if what if this has a really negative effect on on all of you know my reputation and status here it's a threat to you know sort of certainty and certitude it rocks the boat a little bit what if someone tells you something that changes what you know all of that can happen it can it can be a threat to your own goals or ambition because of all the things um, you know, all the sea above. All of those threats, by the way, they're called, we have a name for those. Those are called social threats, social threats. And again, kind of a, you know, a psychology geek term, um, but it's, I want to contrast those against physical threats, physical threats and social threats. Those are the things that sort of come at our brains, you know, our brains that are that are um, really adept at keeping us alive, keeping us safe and keeping us alive. It's one of the primary functions of our brain. We stay safe, we stay alive so that we can go out into the world and, and put all of our talents and our innovation and, into the world. But at, at, at its most 
foundational, you know, service to us is our brain keeps us safe and keeps us alive. And so it's highly attuned to any threats that are coming at us. Now, here's what's really fascinating. I've just listed a bunch of social threats, which maybe you've never really thought of those as social threats before. But I want you to contrast that to the physical threats. And you've all probably experienced some form of physical threat in your life, a scary person or, um, you know, some sort of, you know, traffic encounter, you know, something that the situation or a person that you were around felt like a physical threat to you. And when that happened, if you think back to when that happened, or I, mean, I don't want to bring up any trauma for anyone on this call today, but you've all had some sort of scare, like a physical scare. When you think about what happened to your brain in that moment, is it essentially shut down, didn't it? It it shut down um, all of your what we call your cognitive functioning, all of your executive cognitive functioning. It you know if you were if you were pondering all the works of Shakespeare in that moment, you probably stopped pondering all the works of Shakespeare in that moment. It had no meaning to you in that moment, and a part of your brain called the amygdala. Um, many of you heard of that brain part. It gets talked about a lot. Um, that part of your brain, which is kind of that fight, flight, or freeze part of your brain, it took over. It just took over. And, and it, it intentionally shuts all that other stuff down because it, it's forcing the body's energy um, into preservation, into the fight or flight or freeze mode. Do something. You are under threat here. Take action. That's what your brain is doing in that moment. Here's what I, I have always found really fascinating is your brain treats social threats and physical threats the same way. I'll let that sink in for a second here. Your brain treats social threats, the things you see listed here, my relationships, peace, my reputation, anything that threatens those, it treats it the same as if you were experiencing a physical threat, something that could physically harm you, bring injury or even death to you. It, 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 it responds the same way. Now, intellectually, you know the difference. Intellectually, your brain understands the difference, but that same sort of uh, response, brain response with the amygdala triggering that fight or flight or freeze uh, mode, same, it's the same. And so when you think about that, when you think about why it's so hard to get the courage to have that tough conversation, you can see why it's so hard. Your brain is essentially trying to shut down. One of the best ways to think about this, well, number one, just think about a tough conversation you've tried to have in the past. You probably thought you were all prepared for it, and then you get into the conversation and you're blank. You don't remember really what you're after, and you are not your sharpest, wittiest person in that moment. Or think about standing up to speak in public. Think about how you rehearsed and you you know your stuff and you're so ready, and then you stand up to speak and you don't remember a thing. So here's what we want to do. Here's how we want to think about how we want to think about how to survive, to get better at um, at tough conversations. And I want to start with you've all seen these pictures, like the nailed it pictures on social media. This one we've always found so delightful. It's just I love it. Nice attempt, nice attempt, but not quite what you were thinking it was going to be. Courtney said earlier. Now, I'm, I'm going to work my way into why we're showing these images, but you, you tend to have like this beautiful expectation. I'm going to handle this, this tough conversation so well. I'm, I've got all of my, um, you know, all of my models and, and my, my formulas and, and all of that over here. But it ends up actually sort of looking like the picture on the right. Courtney mentioned earlier that all of leadership is a conversation. It's an interaction. It's a human interaction. And she also mentioned that humans are messy. People are messy. And leaders, if you're, you know, leaders are in the people business. If you're on a team, you're in the people business. And so we, when we teach leadership skills, we actually teach human interaction skills. And one of the things that we're trying to help people understand is human interaction skills are always going to be, always going to result in some version of the picture on the right, because humans are messy. It's, it's not going to, you, you, you think you can create the picture on the left with a tough conversation or some other you know, sort of human interaction. 
you think you're going to create the picture on the left, but it's really in reality going to be more of the picture on the right. And that's, and that's okay. That's okay for it to be messy. Um, and the other thing that we do is, so we teach the, the sort of these core skills that are associated with all human interactions. And we can put those, those core skills on the screen here. We actually teach these things as skills because these are the skills you're going to take into every conversation. Now we're gonna frame them up for you and talk about how they serve you in a tough conversation, but they are essentially the core skills of every conversation, of every human interaction. Because think about it, when you are having a conversation with someone uh, about maybe you're giving them some feedback or you're trying to build trust or you're trying to inspire them or influence them or you're trying to manage a change with them, it's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. You're just having a conversation with someone. And all conversations, all good human interaction that helps to point people in a particular direction they all come from this same set of skills. They all come here. It's not about, and I, I saw a lot of this in your in your uh, comments that you you fed to us before this before the session today. I saw a lot of, you know, I've got to find exactly the right words. I, you don't actually need to find all the right words. Um, remember, we're not after the perfect little cookie monster cupcakes. it's It's not about finding all the right words. Now, I don't want you to take that too far and, and just, you know, think you can just blurt out anything that's on your mind. You do want to have some measure of, of um, preparing and, and being, well, you want to, you know, channel all of, you know, all of these skills, um, but it's not about all this polish. It's not about polish. You're, you're unlikely to be really polished. I don't think being polished is going to serve you well, frankly, in, in a conversation that's, that is, is going to have a lot of emotion in it. Um, a lot of you also mentioned this need to, I'm going to use the word, and I don't think anyone used this word, but you were kind of getting at this idea of, of needing to control the emotion in the conversation. Um, again, that's a, that's a picture on the, on the left kind of idea, that you're going to somehow really control all of this emotion, that you're going to, to, you're going to essentially own the other person's emotions, and you're going to control all of that. You're not. And it's okay, just set that down. You don't own the other person's emotion. There's no need to control that emotion. Again, there are better and worse ways to prepare, to show up to the conversation that you um, are most um, accommodating to people's emotions. And Courtney is gonna talk about a couple of these skills here in a minute that will help you to do that. And you know, some of you also kind of have this sense of, again, if we look at the picture on the left, the sense of a, of a perfect expectation that you are going to be the hero. No one, again, no one used the word hero, but I'm kind of seeing that in some of your, some of your, your, your biggest challenges with tough conversations is that you want to fix it. You want to fix it. You want, you know, to, to result in sort of this perfect outcome or to be the hero. That's just not the case at all. It's not the case at all. So instead what we want to do is, is to show up in these conversations, not expecting perfect, not expecting perfect, but instead to channel, I, I like to refer to it as like channeling, channeling the skill of humility, the skill of curiosity, the skill of empathy and believing in others. You're gonna channel those skills. You're gonna bring that mindset. And the other thing you're going to do is you're going to prepare. You're going to prepare for the conversation channeling those all of those skills you're going to prepare to be humble to be curious to be empathetic and believe in others and part of our programming if you join us you'll hear a little bit later um in in this hour a, a bit of how you can join us for some deeper programming around this but we actually provide guides that will help you to i like to say as outsource your anxiety as you're preparing for a tough conversation, I know some of you are just like you have such a narrative running in your head that it's 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 preventing you from from having the conversation. So we offer guides in how to prepare for conversations that will make sure that you get really clear about what you want out of the conversation. That will help you confront the stories that you're telling yourself about the conversation that are sort of keeping you stuck. Um, the guides will also help you set the tone for the conversation and then prepare for difficult responses and you're going to get them because if you think people aren't going to defend themselves 
in a tough conversation, think again. It would, it's normal, it's it's perfectly okay and normal for people to defend themselves. Your job is to put yourself in a space that you're able to kind of think ahead, to be really empathetic and to think about what, what kind of response are you gonna get and then prepare for it. It will help you to prepare for it. So I said a lot there, um, but there is, there's, it, it, you know, one of the most essential things we hope you walk away with today is that forget about the picture on the left. Embrace the picture on the right, embrace it, be ready to channel these deeper human skills and, and to prepare for and to show up into the conversation with those skills. So I'm going to turn it back over to Courtney, who's going to um, drive us deeper in a couple of these areas. Absolutely. I, I just chuckle when I look at these pictures. Um, one thing I would add, and I'm going to give a pause here intentionally to see if there's any follow-up questions from anything Jackie shared. Um, the expectation versus reality applies to the skills and the preparation and also in, applies to how you get trained to deal with conversations, right? So I do think there's also an expectation that if I get the right training class, it's there's going to be, you know, a spreadsheet to follow or rules of the road or exact, you know, instructions on how to get me through this. And, and so the truth is when you learn to be humble, curious, empathetic, and believe in others, and you lean into those skills, it makes every conversation easier. It's an all the time thing. Any conversation is better if you apply them. Every conversation is easier when you apply them, especially the hard ones. So I'm going to pause. Are there any questions that we want to throw out to the group right now? Just peek in. Good. One of the things that I'm seeing in the Q and A um, is we've always been told not to show our emotions at work, and so that makes it a lot harder. Yeah, we are. Um, thank you for that comment. And you know, one of the things Courtney and I did not tell you about ourselves, um, but we know that many of you know where we come from because we worked with you in the past. Courtney and I have spent, you know, the better part of 35 years working in those organizations <laughs> where. Um, this idea that emotions are the soft stuff and, and we do hard work here. So let's forget about that. Um, I, you know, I would say that if that was true, um, I would embrace it. The problem is that it's just not true that emotions are the hard stuff or the easy, you know, the soft stuff, the squishy stuff. And so we don't deal with those here because we do hard work. I would embrace that if it was true. The problem is it's just simply not true. All human beings are actually driven by emotions. We use logic and reasoning. Oh yeah, we certainly do. I mean, that's what you go to school for, you know, is you learn a lot uh, about logic and reasoning. Um, but logic and reasoning combines with emotions to determine what how you actually perform. We are emotional beings that use logic and reasoning. And the sooner we can embrace that, the sooner you can embrace that as a team member or as a leader, the better off you'll be and, and, and explore it and learn about it. It doesn't, it's not about ruinous empathy, right? You know, and Courtney's going to say something about empathy here in a, in a minute, how to use nice, good, practical empathy. Um, these, all of these, you can see these skills, you can see they get right at this idea of, of dealing with another human being as an emotional human being, because we all are, we all are. Um, so I, thank you for sharing that, uh, that we experience that too, um, that, you know, emotions are not something to bring to work with us. Um, and we just, like I said, I would embrace it if it was true. It's just not true. We are humans all at the end of the day. All right. So let's unpack humility just a little bit. We teach a much longer lesson on this, but to get this started, I want each of you to think about if you have a paper and pencil nearby, I want you to think about a tough conversation that you've recently had or one that you're getting ready for. And just take a minute and jot down the three things that you most want the other person to hear. Just three things really quick. What, what, what is the heart of what you want to accomplish with your tough conversation? Even if you get one. And then I want you to pause and I want you to look at it. And when I, and I want you to ask yourself, whose perspective is rep or whose needs are represented in what you wrote on the paper. And I want to use that as a segue and introduction into the skill of humility. Humility is actively, intentionally 
trying to think of other people, trying to think of yourself less. Yes, you have, there's something going on that you have had an incident about, maybe it's a performance issue, maybe someone did something you didn't like, something bumps against your values, something you judge as good or bad, probably bad if it's a tough conversation. And we have our own perspective on that thing, or we wouldn't be feeling so compelled to have to have or have to avoid the conversation, right? And so what humility does for us right away is invites us to think less about what we think about it and start thinking about the other person. Our favorite definition of humility is humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, less often. It's about frequency. And so sometimes when we're preparing, often when we're preparing for tough conversations, it's a threatening situation under threat. Human beings, we get super selfish. We get super self-absorbed. All of our energy goes back to us. What happened to me? What are they going to say about me? How might they react to me? And practicing humility is our first opportunity to pause and maybe create a little space and say, okay, what might be going on with this person? What if it wasn't about me? What if I took myself out of this? How do I let this happen? How do I help the person? Right? And think of the other person as you're preparing for the conversation. We talk about humility in our leadership development classes all the time. Um, it is the first and most powerful anchor stone because it's very difficult to do any of the other leadership things if you're focused on yourself and you're not a bad person in any way. If you're focused on yourself, it's our brain wiring. It's our humanness. Thinking about ourselves keeps us safe, keeps us fed, keeps us healthy, right? Keeps us connected to other people. But when we are really thinking about every conversation counts, our relationships are how our work gets done. We have a huge opportunity to strengthen those things. If we try to at least shift the balance or more of our energy into thinking just as much about the other person as we do ourselves. And humility gets kind of tricky because if I ask you all, like, what's the opposite of humility? Like, what is humility anyway? And what's its opposite? We teach this in class all the time. We hear all the time, like, oh, the opposite of humility is arrogance. People who think they're a big deal. People who think they're majorly important. I may, I maybe some of you had um, a person's face just pop in your head, like the most arrogant person I know on the planet. Just boom, there they are, right? And they're a big shot. They're, they're, they're talking over others, whatever the things are, right? Arrogance is definitely an opposite because that person is thinking about themselves and they're thinking they're pretty great. But there's another opposite of humility. And it's actually, if you put humility at the top, like straight down the middle is I'm humble. I'm able to think about myself and others in balance. Yeah, an arrogant person is not humble. They're thinking about themselves and they're thinking they're pretty great. The other opposite of humility, if we use our definition, when I'm thinking about myself all the time and I'm thinking I'm not good enough, I'm thinking about myself and I'm worried about my safety. I'm thinking about myself and worried that I get my point across. I'm thinking about myself and my judgment. I'm thinking about myself and my need to win or be right or have the last word. I'm actually coming from the other opposite of humility, which is insecurity. Insecure people are thinking of themselves all the time. And it is honestly, if you think about the places where you have tough relationships, not a lot of trust, it's difficult to build connection with someone else. From what we see, insecurity is actually much more prevalent than arrogance and much more harmful as a leader. Because when people are insecure, they are doing, think about the behaviors that follow, right? They're doing very self-focused things. They're doing self-team um, focused things. They're taking care of number one, not thinking of others. You guys can kind of un unpack this, right? On and on and on. So 
when it comes to tough conversations, one of your first, and this is every conversation and tough conversations, one of the first opportunities you have is to step back and examine what do I want to get across? And if I took myself out of this list and I had a conversation with this person about what's going on from their perspective, from their needs, from their behaviors, understanding their, their history, their experience, their challenges, how might I approach that conversation differently? It's not that I don't have personal needs in the conversation. I do. It's not that I don't have business needs in the conversation. I do. But what if I put them on balance? How might that shift what I say, how I respond? And, and most importantly, like the connection I can create with the other person. So I come in with my list of things I have to get across. I'm going to trigger defensiveness right away, right? It feels threatening and it's very difficult to stay in a relationship. So, oh, I, there's so much stuff we can say about humility. Um, I'm going to pause there because I think I've made most of the points I want to. Um, yeah, I'm just checking myself on that. Yep. So let's talk about a second skill that applies to conversations, which is empathy. And these, these are very related, right? I'm thinking about the other person. Our definition of empathy is imagining what someone else is thinking and feeling, first off. So if you think about we're just being humble, we, we're just imagining what that person, like I'm going to get myself out of it and think about the other person. When I can imagine what they're thinking and feeling, that's our definition of empathy. And one of the things that's very, very difficult when we're going into a tough conversation, a tough conversation is a social threat that Jackie was just explaining, is to not get in self-preservation -pres mode. My things are like, I need to tell them this and I need to tell them that. And here's another thing, right? I'm, I'm sorry, I just rehearsed a conversation. I had my dad with my husband or something. Um, we want to stay in the thing that we call non-reactive empathy, which is to come into the conversation, knowing the point we want to get across, trying to anticipate how that person is coming into the conversation. And first and foremost, we need to what we call acknowledge and validate that person. It's, it's a core human need to be seen and understood, regardless of what they're thinking, regardless of where they're coming from. It's very difficult to stay in a conversation with someone who doesn't see you, who someone with someone who doesn't believe you, with someone who has their own agenda, their own, only their own perspective, they're not interested in yours. And so when we need to have a tough conversation, one well, of the first things we do, practice our humility, think about them, and then show up ready to see the other person, to acknowledge and validate whatever thoughts, feelings, or actions come up. And I wonder how many, I mean, I'm just curious, how many of you I just triggered with this statement? Like, I'm going to acknowledge whatever comes up? Yes, whatever comes up, you can say to someone, I see you. It's understandable. You would fill in the blank. It's understandable you're angry. It's understandable. You're sad. It's understandable. You're disappointed. I can say that because I'm a human being. And so therefore no emotional reaction that that person have it as is foreign to me. Now I don't have to agree with their, their behavior. This is really important distinction. I can see that you were mad. I can sit, I can acknowledge that you were disappointed. I can acknowledge that you were frustrated. And that does not mean I have to endorse the behavior that followed. When you were mad, you slammed the door understandable you're mad it's not acceptable to slam doors i can see you're sad understandable in your situation anyone in your situation might feel that way but i need fill in the blank whatever the behavior that's not appropriate so this is a this empathy is not endorsement is a really tricky thing for people to wrap their heads around i hope you guys have questions about this or you can sleep on it and wake up in the night like chew on this you can see people, you can value them, you can care about them and not agree with them and ask for behaviors that align with your company's values, with your company's expected policies, whatever. Both things can and need to be true because the person who you're having a tough conversation with, their behavior is a human response to something. And what they need most to stay connected to you, to stay engaged with you, to stay performing on your team is to know that they're in an environment with a leader and teammates who value and care about them, 
who understand and accept them. Their imperfectness. And then it's okay to say, like Jackie says a lot, chapter one, here's the thing, here's the behavior, or here's the emotion that I see and, and value in you as a human being. It's understandable that you'd be mad, disappointed, frustrated. And here are the behaviors that we need to see or can't see, right? Because this is how we want to treat each other here. Acknowledge and validate. It sounds like I see you. It's understandable. Anyone in your situation might feel that way. It does not sound like I know because I don't. Right? It doesn't sound like it's okay. Excusing behavior. It's just, I see you. And the reason we do this across the board in conversation, if we want to have connections with other human beings, they have to have a space where they feel valued and cared about. And so our first step, we're having a tough conversation is to see the other person and make sure we know we see them. And with human beings, listening, acknowledging, and validating, seeing others, that's equivalent to love. We send a message that we care when we accept people wholly for their emotional responses. And it's totally okay to hold them accountable to behaviors that align with your company's values and expectations. When it comes to tough conversations, you are going, this is especially going to come up um, as you're preparing for difficult responses. Jackie mentioned in our longer class, we, we teach you how to do this. Like if you know, if you go into a conversation expecting that someone's going to throw the book of data at you, your first intelligent, reasonable response to that is going to be to defend it to argue, to explain. And actually, if you want to maintain a connection with a person, your first response needs to be, I see, like I can understand why you want to share that data with me. It seems really important to you. And then you go from there. So this is a, this is a huge skill, big thing we impact, unpack it in, in broader ways in our classes, but um, it's so critical to a tough conversation because if you skip this step and, and just go straight to the what's, that connection, that opening up of the other person, the safe space to continue the dialogue and get to a good place, it will never happen. If they don't, if, if human beings don't feel seen, heard, and validated, they will armor up, shut down, unplug, whatever analogy you want to use. And they won't really participate or trust you through the rest of that conversation because their core human need to be seen was not met. It's really, really important. Um, questions or anything you'd add, Jack? Well, one of the things, if you're interested more in this concept, because this concept catches some people off guard, I think. Um, I think we all generally have embraced the idea of empathy without maybe really thinking about what it is. Like in uh, and, and this, I think this challenges people. I find that this catches people a little off guard um, when we ask them to acknowledge and validate really anything, you know, just in, because it is just saying, I see you, I'm gonna meet you where you are. Nothing human is foreign to us because we are human. Um, and I love the chapter one, chapter two idea of chapter one, I see you, we're human together, life is messy, you know, kind of embracing that concept. And then chapter two is, and I expect you <laughs> to meet the expectations as, as, as I'm going to outline. You can, as a matter of fact, when you acknowledge and validate someone, when you truly embrace that sense of empathy, it's by doing that, that you are essentially creating permission to ask them to do hard things. And instead, those of you who kind of dance around, someone talked about, you know, they dance around performance feedback, uh, they, they, they soft pedal, they sugarcoat. Um, when you, I would, I would recommend to you, try this. Try doing what Courtney just described. Because you then find yourself, you know, having more permission. You're going to feel like you have more permission. And I would argue you do have more permission to then ask someone to do something hard you know, to step up their game in a, in a challenging way. Um, for those of you who are readers and want to explore this more deeply, there's a great book. It's where we actually got the statement of empathy is not endorsement. There's a great book by a guy named Dylan Marin called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. 
And it's, I think, you know, we don't talk about politics here on our webinar, but um, I think we can all see, um, we can all see that the, the, this particular skill could be really helpful in our very divisive political world right now. Conversations with people who hate me. So if you're a reader, write that one down. Um, excellent read. The question we have in the chat is, how do you help someone focus on the issues in a conversation when they're emotionally charged or feeling hurt or disrespected. And I think this, hopefully this lesson, this is, this is how you do it. First and foremost, you have to see the emotions and acknowledge and validate those. It is your only hope to ever get to the issues of the conversation because people who are hurt, sad, disrespected are focused in your conversation on their hurt their disappointment, their anger. They are not listening to your issues if they are having those emotions. So the first thing, and actually your question kind of puts a fine point on the lesson, which is the first thing you have to do is see them and say, it's understandably be hurt. I'm sensing you're disappointed. It makes sense you would be. And give them space to process that. Sometimes you may choose to stop the conversation there and say, you know what? We need to come back and we'll talk about the issues because you're obviously you know, you got some stuff to work through here. That's okay. Sometimes they'll be like, oh, wow. Thank you for listening. Let's have the rest of the conversation. That will depend on the situation, obviously. But I, I the, the point I want you guys to get here is there is no focusing on the issue if they're, if they're stuck in their emotions. They can't hear you. They can't hear you. And the, the way it's kind of like the secret sauce, like Jackie said, try it. The way you help, I always see emotions as little lamps, like oil lamps in your throat and your heart and your stomach, like where your chakras sit. When you say to someone, I see you, it's understandable you'd feel that way. You speed up the oil in those lamps being burnt off. The chances are going to be less mad or they're going to get over it and have a way to set it down. It's going to increase drastically because that's what they want. They want their hurt seen. They want their disappointment seen. And the light kind of helps it dissipate. People who don't, that's a different conversation, persistent resistance. I know you're all thinking about them. I'll teach that somewhere else. But um, all right, I'm going to keep moving with the time we have left. Great question. I hope the answer helps a little bit. Um, so now what? So we have been mentioning a lot. We do teach a class in tough conversations. And we want to spend just a little bit of a minute giving you guys some information about this. Um, we... Again, it is the cookie monster pictures, people. It is messy. When you come to our class, we teach you the skills that apply to every conversation. We are not going to give you cookie cutters that say stamp, stamp, stamp. Here's what you do. None of your conversations are perfect. But we are going to unpack even more detail than we introduced here, what makes conversations tough. Um, give you more of the psychology. Like, you are so normal. Everybody avoids this. This is so quarter our humanness to not want to damage a relationship that we would avoid conversations. And then we will teach you some fundamental interaction skills that help you really get your mindset right. And then Jackie already mentioned the preparation tools. Like I, I'm from Edgewood, Iowa. We have a rodeo for 25 years. Like it's a bit of a rodeo. You, you prep and you think about where you want to start, and then it can go anywhere from there. And you kind of have to hold on and keep your goals in mind as you go through it. And we teach you about that. We do not teach you how to ride the mechanical bull, but we do um, prepare you for the fact that this is what your messy conversation is going to be. Um, and then we'll share insights and habits on those tough conversations in that class. So um, we are doing something new. We are actually, we had a lot of requests because so many of you do not actually live here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa with us to offer the tough conversations virtually. So we're going to be doing that in September. Um, if you are interested in this, we have an offer going on until August 16th where you can come and a friend or a coworker or someone else can come for half off the price. So you can email Sarah at Slingshot25 if you want to join us. Um, we're doing individual follow-ups with people as well, but we would love to um, see you in the tough conversations class. The first time we're running it virtually, so we'd love your feedback on how that works. I think we've done it one time as a pilot, so you're not getting, you know, completely brand new things, um, but very excited to share more about this very important topic and something that people are just ah, craving, you know, to get better at tough conversations. So this is what our off our class, our next class offering is. Um, so join us if you can. We would love to see you. And 
you can get more information about that by emailing Sarah. She'll help you out. Um, so I think with that, we'll see if there's any other questions before we let folks go. If you're not following us, you want access to our podcasts, our webinars, um, Shotcast. We're doing some new episodes this week. Um, please follow us on LinkedIn. That's probably where we spend most of our time. We also have content on Facebook, Instagram, and you can get our Shotcast on Spotify. So from Jackie and Courtney and Kim and Sarah, um, thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, and we'll just pause and see if there's questions before I let everyone go. I think we got to most things in the Q&A, either by typing a response or answering them live here. Um, but if you have any other questions for us, if something comes up for you later in the next hour as you're thinking about this or stumble into a situation that you now need to have a tough conversation and realize maybe you should have listened a little more, <laughs> um, feel free to uh, you know find us through all those channels we just shared with you. You can always shoot us an email. We love hearing directly from our clients. We're easy to find. I'm Jackie at Slingshot25.com. Courtney is Courtney at Slingshot25.com. So easy ones to remember. Um, and I think with that, though, we'll say goodbye. Thank you.